The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. So Tim, you're in charge with all the smart questions. I'll just follow no, up. No, 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 no. You always do <laughs> smart questions. Um, She's drinking a cocktail while she's talking. Oh, good. Uh, good. 12 in the afternoon. Oh, good, Krista. <laughs> Wait a second. We did not know. Hey. We didn't. Dina just gave a thumbs up. She was like, Wait a second. This would add a whole new dimension. They celebrate Christmas all through the January. Of Tim, New York go City. up to the it's bar. New We're going to change right. the whole cadence of this interview. Yeah. I'm sober. Just so you know. What are you drinking? A mojito? No, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a seltzer. It's an afternoon drink. Oh. You know. It looked like a fancy salsa. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you put a lemon in it, it's fancy, you know? Yeah, you put, know. You have water and, you know, you put a lemon in it, it's fancy, so. All right, welcome everybody. This is the Plenary Eastern Podcast. I'm Tim Wagon with... Hello, I'm Jessica Bellis. Today, talking to Krista, it is just, it is fun to um, be reminded of the plein air space and warmer days to come and connect with friends that we don't like get to see but once a year. So um, we had a great talk today with um, the fabulous painter and um, fun person, Krista Pisano. Yeah, I think that she is, uh, it's a very unique interview and um, where we don't really talk about small paintings that much, really, which is very <laughs> Um, so, uh, take a listen. This is Chris Pisano. This, uh, there's probably a main, we both know Krista Pisano very well. Um, there's probably a lot of ways we could introduce her. I, I would just say, uh, one of the most, you know, sort of unique, self-driven um, kind of painters out there. You know, it comes in with her own style, definitely her own sort of largesse as far as what, what size painting she does, and just a really unique sort of person that has endeared herself to Plenary Easton over the last how many years? Se- six, seven years, something like that, Krista? Krista, how many years have you been at Plenary Easton? She's not going to know. We should, oh, this is when we don't yeah, do our don't research know. before an event. Will you- I think at... 2015, I think, was my first year. Yeah. yeah. And I've done everyone except the the little, the summer pandemic yeah, the, version since. <laughs> since, well, you don't even have to explain why that would be. Yeah. Um, so for a while, we've known Krista. Krista, did he sum you up? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, no, there's no way to sum. Just, you know, we've just, Krista is sort of like, I think um, because of, you know, the way she comes into town in her big Jeep and like she goes everywhere. She lives in their Jeep, basically. I mean, you know, would you agree with that, uh, Krista? You know? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> She doesn't technically live in her Jeep. I don't and technically. She just agrees with like, so don't, Yeah, she, she, yeah, yeah, but um, we're what we're looking Obviously, at. Obviously, she doesn't really live in her Jeep, but you know what? I mean, you get the metaphor out there if you if you understand. Well, us, I think us plain air painters who are on the road feel like we live in our exactly. vehicles. I guess there I, are I, definitely I, some nights, like you know, this past summer, I slept in the front seat because I had no choice. You know that guy, so. Well, maybe if I slept in the Jeep one night, technically I kind of lived in it, but (laughs) I guess I've known like, you know, John, uh, Brandon Sills and, you know, all, you know, a lot of these people that you drive these things. I don't know what car they drive, but I know you drive a yellow Jeep every year and you've driven driving a Jeep and it's like your main, like, that's kind of what I'm talking about as far as like how, you know, uh, and I don't know if that happens in other towns as well. 
where they're like, okay, there, you know, there's Krista's back or whatever, you know, but it just kind of feels like Krista's back. You know what I mean? You, yeah. you know, she's, that, that's kind of what I was talking about, <laughs> sort of. She's back. And she's yeah, I can't hide in that Jeep. for the first time today. What's that? <laughs> I can't hide in that Jeep. Can't get away with anything. Can't, <laughs> right, right, you know, right. you just know it. It's, it's, I call it butterscotch. Oh. I call it yellow. It's kind of looks like a butterscotch oh. color, but you know, it's, it's yellow. <laughs> Krista, because I have just such a fascination about like the whole uh, journey and also about early childhood education, like were you always an artist? Like when you were teeny, you know, were you the one who was hoarding the crayons and drawing cool things when you were tiny or, you know, like when did you really start um, feeling like you were called to make art? Well, I, I've told this story many times, but I wanted to be a ballerina oh. and that's what I thought I was going to be. And, um, I guess since preschool, you know, I had been taking ballet all the way up through, um, sixth or seventh grade. Um, but on the side, I was always, you know, you know, making things, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like I, I hoarded, you know, I don't think I always had a lot of art materials around, but I just found things and made things. It's not like my parents were like, you can't have art materials, but I don't know. I don't know if I ever asked for anything, right. or, but I was always finding things and making things. And I was very into um, watching all the painters who are on PBS. You know, we all know Bob Ross, but there sure. are a bunch of other painters. I was also really into cooking shows and I don't cook a thing now. Hmm. But I would like um, Yan can cook was on there, but he was making these like creative, like he'd right. make birds out of, you know, they, I, so I think it was that there was definitely a creative thing. Um, but, you know, the famous story goes, dad got a VCR, you know, the VCR came out and he was like, oh, we'll get, you know, the dance recital on on tape, you know, which takes about six months back then to get <laughs> from the dance recital. Then you got to sure. wait. And it's like Christmas time by then. And he popped that thing in. And, you know, you're, you're, you know, I was a girl prepubescent. You're in these little costumes. I saw myself and it was like all this elegance. And then there was like me who was up there, like <laughs> Lady Gaga from like the monster tour or whatever, you know, like I just, you know, there was no grace, the light, you know, nothing. And I quit. And my mother always had us like signed up to do something. And I was always doing softball. Crystal, looking and... back, were you just like, what? What was that? Like, yeah. it, like I, I don't like. Do you think that you were that bad, or were you just in such a no. like adolescent self-critical? Like, I, I, I appreciate the, the joking, <laughs> the joking sort of notion of it, but I think that we. You know, everybody well, has those like amplified insecurities in the exact right. time frame that you're talking about. Like, yeah, like you're awkward. And I, I would I would say it's probably almost like maybe I'm not a singer, but maybe if you're a singer and you make it onto um you know, what's that show? American Idol or something, mm -hmm. and you make it on TV to like the um audition you know, spot sure. that, like you're in the bad audition spot. You know, you're not in the good one. Like I equated to that. Like, you had to I, process I definitely through had, that. Like, a moment where I was like, Oh no, I'm not doing that anymore. You know? And I, I mean, I remember seeing it like, you know, everything looked forced and I was like, I want to do that anymore. Wow. And, um, and then mom signed me up How for our classes. You How old no, she, you? How she old said sixth grade. Six gra oh, six, uh, yeah, what are you, 12, 13, yeah, a little something younger. Something like so that. You knew that it was forced. I mean, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah and yeah. it wasn't fun anymore. Like, I think I was, like, kind of doing it for the costumes. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, if you've seen me at the openings, I'm always in some sort of tutu or fluffy thing, <laughs> which yeah. explains yeah. the whole, you know, I still wish I could be a ballerina, but I'm not. <laughs> so basically, so, if I'm playing the role of your mom, I'm like, fine, you can quit ballet, but you're going to do something. Is yeah, that like, yeah. <laughs> like, it wasn't sort of like, you know, uh, uh, no wire hangers, but you right. know, it was, it was, um, well, you want to paint, you know, I don't know if she just didn't want me out of her hair, but right. Again, um, that was, you know, part, there's two as a mother, brothers. that was definitely part of that. <laughs> right. And, and it, you know, it's a, it, I think it was, you know, I went to Catholic school. I definitely had learning disabilities. Back then, they didn't treat that or test you. And I think they saw, like, I think maybe my parents did see some sort of direction, creative direction to go into. 
And um, I remember going to that first painting class and thinking it was going to be like step by step on Bob Ross, you know, kind of like right. those wine things now, like sure. where you go to like, you yep. know, and they go, okay, first do this. I remember like all these paints being thrown down and, you know, here, squirt, you know, they put them in the line and said, you know, you know, put some paint out and, you know, the teacher kind of went around and he made a little sketch and then said mix this color up and do the shadows or whatever i remember the first class being like this isn't like bob ross like this i don't know if i want to do this and i stuck through it and i did go through that whole um i think it was about four weeks one day a week um it was in the summer i finished that painting and i remember going i made that mm. like i i couldn't understand how i made it but i i made that right. and um I was kind of hooked from that part on, and it had a, that it, point it, on. It had a Both. sense of permanence, whereas some of the performance art that you have done maybe feeds you in that creative way in the moment, but doesn't really necessarily until you see it on VHS um, yeah. have that, or Betamax, <laughs> as it might have been. Um, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have that same permanence as, you know, again, being able to hold that creativity in your hand like that. Maybe it was like a sense of satisfaction, mm. you know, where I wasn't getting that from the dance or whatever. But um, I'm really glad I switched because I say to myself all the time, like, I don't know what I'd be doing. <laughs> like if I didn't have that teacher and that, you know, that instruction and, you know, do it like I really don't know what I'd be doing. A, you real, know? a real change moment for you. So then yeah. through, through high school, were you leaning into art too? Like, did it just continue on from there? Yeah, I started at the Ridgewood Art Institute in, in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Uh, my teacher, John John Philip Osborne, um, sort of took me under his wing. So again, like he he saw something in me, thank God. And, um, you know, I started going two days a week, then three days a week, and I was kind of answering phones. And, you know, he was doing it, you know, would show me how to do, you know, paint things and whatever. And um, I'd be you know, oil priming can, uh, lead priming canvases, like when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old, like all these really old school things that didn't really click as to how important this really was that I was learning this stuff. Cause again, I feel like I was so young, um, that when I got older, I said, Oh wow. Like I was really lucky. Like I, I, again, I don't know where I would be if I didn't have that. Right. It just kind of went all the way through to, you know, now what do I do when I go to college, you know? And did you go to um, college? I did. I wound up, um, I graduated high school in 95. And at the time, there wasn't really any art schools I was interested in, in the traditional um, painting and teaching. Um, and then a small school in Connecticut um, got its accreditation. It had been there. It had been a school since the 70s, I guess, in uh, Lyme Academy, of fine arts in Old Lyme, Connecticut, which was also a um, uh, art mecca for the, the now called Lyme Impressionists, which were artists that came from all over and spent their summers there. Um, but this school had just gotten a, um, a degree program going. And I wound up, I was still was unsure because it wasn't like a college everybody else was going to. I went to also an all girls college prep high school where everybody was going to college and had dorms and, you know, this and that. This had no dorms. You had to find your own place to live. So I think it was a very intimidating to be, oh, I have to live on my own and cook. And like, <laughs> there's no food card and whatever. So I had taken a year off um, and worked in a bagel shop for a year. I didn't do much painting in between there. I think I was just kind of socializing. and yeah. But it was good. It was good. It, got, it gave me a little bit, I think, that year to grow up a little bit and then really want to go to college. Yeah. So then I did those four years there and then went to grad school after that. So, yeah, it just continued till, <laughs> till now. <laughs> so. so, well, well, that's just well, it, the reason we're kind of a little bit dead air there is because normally we're talking to someone who was like went to architectural design school or graphics afterwards. You know what I mean? Started that mm -hmm. way. Right. right? I think we had one illustration, person. you know. Yeah, you, you know, yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess I'll ask about your first teacher. When you say, thank God you had that kind of stuff, putting the stuff with lead on, you know, staining canvases with lead paint or whatever, why was, what was that uh, uh, so important to you um, when you say, thank God I had that going on still when I was still learning or whatever? Well, I, 
I feel like it's, you know, as artists, we read about Michelangelo and, and Raphael and all these guys and they're, do, you know, learning anatomy and they had, you know, they're making their own materials and everything. And and I I didn't realize I thought as a teenager, everybody's doing that. You know, anybody who's learning how to paint is making their own materials. And that's just part of it, because that's what, you know, it says in the books these guys did, you know, thousands uh-huh. of years ago. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, again, it was like I think like really it wasn't until I was in my 20s, these aha moments of, oh, wow, I know that. Like, I know how to do that. Like, I did that, you know, and it, it you know, I could fully appreciate it yeah. now when I got older. And it's a lot it's stuff that a lot of people I didn't realize didn't know how to do. Right. Your normal is the only normal you really know. It's like the perspective, you're, the lens you have. Right. Right. Krista, what what do you learn in in uh, four years of college art? Is it, is it art? is it art history more, or is it you know? And then you go to grad school for what was your major? Well, the the Lime Academy had, um, I think at the time they just had um, painting painting and sculpture majors. Uh, yeah, I think they added a drawing. You know, unfortunately, from now till. Uh, then till now, the Lime Academy is now, um, they had gotten into, they, they had lost their accreditation as a college. So it's, I don't think it's tech, technically a college right now, but that's a whole other story for another right. day. Yeah. Um, you know, some artists that at, from Plain Air Easton do teach there now. It's, it's become a, um, still a place of learning. Uh-huh. Um, so when I went there, I did, um, they're very heavy on, um, they were very heavy on anatomy and drawing, which I had, I really had no drawing skills when I went there. I knew how to paint. Not, I mean, I still don't know how to paint. I guess my question, my my (laughs) question, Chris, is like, if you go, if you, if you're a math major in college, you take algebra and then you take trigonometry and then you take pre-calculus. If you take sculpture and painting, like, what do you take? Is it more just come back? You're going to do more painting or you you do anatomy. Is it, well, now we're going to draw the, chest this year but next year we're going to draw the pp or whatever you know what i mean like (laughs) (laughs) well it's somehow i knew uh, that's where he was headed with this uh, and i was like i'm sorry for i'm sorry for calling out some of the world's best art i'm sorry i apologize for that anyway like (laughs) but it's i think what you're asking is like you know what is the curriculum yeah yeah, what do you what do you you know everybody says you know the architecture i kind of get you know what i mean or graphic design i kind of like painting sculpture what how many years of that like what do you do the second year well no matter well no matter what you come in as just like whether it's you know architecture or whatever you still have to take your math english you know whatever just to get your okay, got, okay. the accreditation gotcha. but it's the same thing with the art if you're a sculpture major you still have to take painting one if you're a painting major you still have to take sculpture one so you they you know it's the being well-rounded you know and so i I do i'm not a sculptor um nails my long nails and clay don't go well together (laughs) (laughs) it's always been an issue i just you know i've been able to see what i can you know i know what i want to make but my hands won't make it you know that was very frustrating but i had to do it Right. And I had to pass it. So you have to do classes like that. So like first year would be drawing one, painting one, anatomy one. And then you could, you know, you know, sophomore year, you could take two painting classes. The sculptors would maybe take an extra sculpture class. So, you know, you you go towards your, you know, my my I was there as a painting major, you know, but. OK, gotcha. you know, so, but, then, but then you've been like a professional fine artist all the while then i mean like did did you then graduate from from grad school and then basically just start getting your work into galleries like talk about that transition from from student to selling like how does that work or how did that work for you i'd have to say that was that was probably the scariest time And, and and i'm even i'm even talking scarier than you know, quitting a part-time job and going full-time painter as an adult. Like, I think that the most insecure time for me was that transition between grad school 
and moving back home. I'm like, what do I do now? I've had a teacher since I'm, th- you know, 13, 14 years old telling me what to do or. Right. It's one know. thing to submit your your studies for grades versus, OK, wait, this right. is my livelihood. Like this is I'm putting myself out there and putting it all on the line. It's right. sort of what like it's it, like, right? Well, yeah, but right. everybody and, everybody does that with jobs. With, with if, if you're a painter, you you know you're not going to a job unless you're again against a graphic designer or an architectural or drawing doing person, commissions like or that. like there's right. she's doing something totally different, right? But it's also like you know I'm not in school now where you know you're painting one teacher, or painting two teachers says, okay, the student show is happening. You all have right. to put something in. Yeah. Like now I'm on my own. I got to make my own decision. So I had moved, you know, I, I went to um, grad school, New York Academy of Art in Manhattan, which is very close to where I, my parents are in Hillsdale, New Jersey, which was, you know, 25 minute drive, but I still lived. Um, I was living in Queens at the time. I moved home and dad said, I don't care what you do. You want to paint. That's fine. But you got to get a job, whether it's in art or something. So um, I wound up and and like, what do you do? What do I just paint and sell artwork? That transition, nobody talks about that transition, mm-hmm. right? Like you don't just go right back no. right into galleries. Okay. Um, so what I did was what I thought you were supposed to do is rent a studio you know, so pretty much I was working, I was living at home, so I wasn't really paying rent, but I was paying my bills. So I worked part-time. I found a part-time job and I was working as a um, crafter making for a company called D. Blumchen and Company, making German Victorian Christmas ornaments, like really small, you hmm. know, little. I, I answered an ad in the paper. They hired me as a painter because I could paint little tiny faces and I could match colors, really, is what she, my boss had said she hired me on. But that's um, pretty lucky and serendipitous, like, in and of itself. I mean, again, it's not like you right. were back at the bagel shop. You were still using right. those, like, like you know, again, um, sometimes my dad gets down on me because I uh, he's like, are you actually using that finance degree that I paid for? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, how does yep. that relate to the plein air podcast, Jessica? Yeah. You know, but it sounds like even in your like finding temporary employment, you were really using those skills that you had been, been learning since you were in seventh grade. Right. It wasn't, you know, it was a weird time too, because it was post 9-11. I started yeah. grad school about sure. a week before 9-11. I was downtown. Um, you know, we were already, I was already t- attending a grad school where we had like a five alarm fire the summer before. So we were displaced to begin with. So I did two years at that grad school being completely displaced, moved home. The economy is all wacky. Yeah. It was hard to get a job. I actually, I think it was about six months. I couldn't get a job at a restaurant. I couldn't get a job. It was a really weird time. And I just happened to answer that ad, but then that was funding the studio. And then I started like just, I could, there was an art newspaper in the Hudson Valley here. I don't know if they have it everywhere, but I'd, I'd get it and I'd go to the back and I'd start seeing like things to enter that applied to me. Like, oh, lands, you know, landscape was always my favorite thing to paint. So anything like I was like, oh, I have a painting. I could submit that, you know, oh, can I afford to submit this? OK. And I would just like enter these shows and I'd get rejected and get into shows and then I'd go to the opening and, and, you know, that's kind of how it started. And I started networking a little bit and I started, I got involved with a lot of plein air auctions where you paint, you know, during the day in, it's almost like a plein air event. Like you have to stay in this town, paint something, come back and we're auctioning it off. You'll get part of the, the money and the rest will go to the art center or whatever. So I was, very efficient in doing that kind of stuff. I got involved in many art organizations and then those kind of led to shows and then gallery owners go to those shows. And then I'd wind up in gallery shows and it just kind of, it's that like, social network off from there. Again. When you were yeah. painting in college and whatever, were you, uh, we can hit this on this next side. Were you always painting small stuff or were you painting big stuff when you were working in college? Not as small as I'm painting now. Yeah, <laughs> that's what, kind of what, I, what size, what size were you painting back then? Just curious. Um, I, I guess normal size. Uh, 20 12 by 30, 12 by, 12 by 6. 60. Yeah. 12, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, my, grad pro- my grad school project was 6 feet by 6 feet. Oh. 
That's we got everyone yeah, in we, the plenary world say, thinking. We need to see a picture of that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One thing that Tim didn't mention at the top of the show is, Christy, you do have a very distinctive um, style and sort of trademark about your work. You know, it, it is not that it is all one thing by any stretch of the imagination, but those who follow the plenary circuit it doesn't take you long to start being able to identify a Christopher. <laughs> and I, I think just to just to like go back, I think that's exactly what I said in my opening. Well, well I'm not say, well, I'm not having said that. I think that's exactly not, what I said. You did not actually <laughs> mention the tiny works. Of I know, art but I that, think I said what you just you said without mentioning it. it. I'll just ask you all listeners to go back and listen again. Anyway. <laughs> What's, yeah, I mean, it's so. It's let's talk about unique. let's talk about creativity and and style and how you how one can find their niche, you know, because I think that there mm-hmm. are a lot of, of of artists out there who have an evolving sense of style. And again, you are always growing and changing and pushing yourself as an artist. I would think you're not like waking mm-hmm. up and saying, "Time to make the donuts." I hope you know you're looking right. to continue to do better. Um, right. But but talk about that. How did you find yourself home where you are now? Um, as far as the size of my artwork and what I'm doing. Well, the style, um, yeah. Nice, I mean, I like, style. I don't think it's just size. I mean, like, I, I, you know, I don't think that you are prohibited from painting no, larger, no. but I think it's where, yeah. you're, it's where your brain still is, no, well, right? What you said about finding your own creativity, I think, is what is really the question there. It's like, how did you, how did you get here to where you are but through finding your own creativity, I think? Well, is what, you know, there's two parts to it. So, just if you want to in, talk just give about, us the interesting part. <laughs> Please leave out the boring stuff, Krista. Everything's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I, it, you were talking before, you know, before the break or whatever about, you know, my six foot by six foot painting I did in grad school, and did I always paint that that you know, the size, sizes. Of I just wanted to, I was wondering, really wondering, were you, were you telling your teachers, no, I'm going to paint small or like, were you doing no. what the class said? That's what I was, that's all the question was about. It wasn't about your no, style. I now. really just, you know, I started, I, I, I really started painting small cause I couldn't afford to paint big. And I was, a, I was, um, and I wasn't painting the sizes I'm painting now. I was painting maybe six by eight, eight by 10, five by seven. Um, because I, I was working a part-time job. I was renting this studio. I was entering as many shows as I possibly could. I couldn't afford framing. So I was like buying framing and I taught myself how to gold leaf or metal leaf. So I was metal leafing these frames. And I just started like, I figured I can't, you know, and I'm still learning. I'm like, I have no teacher. I have to figure out how to paint myself. I have no one to go to. I didn't really have a network exactly where I live to be like, hey, what do you think of this? You know, so I was trying to figure it out all by myself. And I was doing all these little paintings and kind of like, okay, this one's going to this show. This one's going here or whatever. Um, That's and really then cool. I, yeah, it, it's, it's, and it wasn't. But you, you, know, you had said earlier, you were painting little on these, this German Christmas right. ornaments earlier. I think, and I worked for that company for about 15 years. That's a um, long time, Krista. It is. <laughs> and, you know, they were so wonderful <laughs> to me, and they're still wonderful people. And they, they allow, you know, I went into that job saying, listen, I'm a painter. I'm trying to have a career as a painter. So I need something that's really flexible for me. Can I have two days off? Can I work every other day? And they were like, fine. Um, we were very big on the, you know, Christmas time was a big season for us. Easter was a big season for us. The summer was a bit slow. So that's why I could do some of these events, small, you know, these plain air events and whatever. And I could kind of change my schedule around. But I think that there were, a, there were a bunch of artists when I started working there and we've all kind of divvied up the projects. But then as time went on and again, it was a weird time. The economy was weird. I was post nine 11, you know, I'm in the, you know, New York, New Jersey, area is just a really difficult time. Um, I wound up being one of the only artists. So I was kind of like, you know, making a lot of this stuff with the owner. And, and I think the smaller I got, I mean, like I was doing, I went from just kind of doing painting and stuff to now I'm doing this wire work and this beading work. And the only thing I wasn't allowed to do was sew. Cause aside from cooking, I can't sew either. <laughs> <laughs> so I was there like, you can't sew anymore. I was like, okay, good. Cause I don't want anything to do with that. But, um, that definitely influenced where I 
the size of my paintings. I think I was so used to doing these little, this little hands work that my hands became part of that, you know, making that these practice. little. Oh, really sure, cool. it's like practice. practice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that now as, you know, as a professional artist making my living this way, I'm finding that just like I didn't set out to put myself in this box to paint these little paintings. It just kind of happened. Um, I, I feel like I'm in this new, um, this new part of my career where I'm finding vision where when I was a young art student, I was like, Oh, to be, you know, to be something, I got to have a vision. You know, I think like with maturity as an artist, things just come like they don't, you can't find them. Like you can't say, Oh, I'm going to paint little and I'm just going to start painting little. And that's my thing. Or I'm going to paint big, or I'm going to like, or I'm going to paint these, um, you know, this subject matter and that's going to be my thing. I find it to be forced. And I think that whenever I tried to do that, well, and again, I think maybe, forced. maybe people can do that for a short period of time, but you can start right. seeing the heart fade from those paintings. I mean, I have certainly right. witnessed that. I'm, I'm certainly not going to call out any plein air painters, but you know, you can sort of get to a point where you're like, I feel like I've seen that painting before and it's not as good as when you were doing right. that painting before. I feel you know? like, I feel like you're talking about my quick draw every year. Tim, we've got to, <laughs> Tim, we've got to talk. He's right. He's right. Um, but no, I mean, I think that that makes that makes real sense. So, talk about that vision that you have now. Um, you know, I think I think there was a turn during during the lockdown, hmm. right? I think a lot of us artists weren't, you know, a lot of us painters, you know, weren't terribly upset to be locked in our studios for six months, you know? Um, did we miss people? Yes. Did we miss like, you know, openings and being out there? Yes. But, um, I think that, you know, being alone in your thoughts and with all these things that were going on, um, not just medically, but politically in the world, um, or in our, in our country, especially too, it's like, you know, your, your thoughts keep turning. And all I had here was myself. I was here by myself and I was participating in events virtually. And, you know, something happens like it, you know, and I don't know what, you know, what did, but I started, I think it had to be told to me that, oh, there's something going on here, you know? And I, and I was, you, you know, when you live with your work in your room or surrounded by all this artwork, you know, I don't go to a studio. My studio is in my house, which is how I like it. Um, you know, you're constantly around this stuff and sometimes you can't see what you're doing. And there was definitely more of a spiritual side that started coming out of my work. Um, and, and I still don't quite understand it, Sometimes um, I like when it happens, <laughs> don't we all? But um, and I think being on the, you know, in all these plein air events, it kind of happens the same thing too. Like you go, you're bouncing from one event to another event to another event that you don't kind of see where you're going. Are you just producing artwork for the sake of producing, or is there a vision that is coming out when you're out there by yourself? For me, like nighttime is when really there's this magical thing that happens when I'm out there alone painting a nocturne. Well, and, and I guess I should yeah. mention that Krista Pisano, have you, you have won two back to back, well, back to back, not counting 2021. You have won at least two best nocturne um, awards at plein air Easton. So when she says she feels like the magic is happening at night, I, I think that she's, that that's been validated by some really like <laughs> well, professional people who have agreed. Yeah. And I mean, that's the icing on the cake, right? I would imagine. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say what Tim said just a little bit differently, and it's a question that we've asked before. Krista, do you know when you've painted a really good painting? Like, when you did paint those best Nocturne ones, are you like, hell yeah, no. like, this one is a good no. one. This one, you never know. It never, no. ever. I mean, there's because, every because, once because this while. is one thing that I think is kind of baloney when artists say this, is they always <laughs> talk about the ones they scrape. Well, so they know the bad ones. But how could you know the bad ones? You think that there's like bad and then meh well, and that's all there is? That that's kind of leads me to another question. So you were the first you talked about the first painting in the first segment. You, you, you know, and you were like I did that. Do you remember what that painting was? Uh -huh. You still have that painting? 
I do actually because I'm moving. <laughs> it's right here. Not that anybody can really see it, but that's your first um, painting. That's really wow, nice. Wow, it's really nice. It's a still life yeah. painting. It Look, has, it's big. It, it is really big. It has some grapes, yeah, two slices of that oranges, was the first thing and you a. Did? Yeah, no, it's when yeah. that guy when that guy said right. mix those paints when your mom sent you that class. Right. That's the first thing you did. Yeah. What I'm just going to tell yeah, everybody. What I'm going to tell everybody is that um, that uh, I can totally see why her teacher was like. I yeah. can only <laughs> like I can I can totally yeah. picture what my yeah. um, sixth seventh grade version of that would have looked like <laughs> right. in my first art class. They were like, and I can see how they were like they'd be like Don't Tim, play softball. Tim to Do the left, Tim to the left, <laughs> yeah. Jessica to the left. Krista, we're going to ask you to step to the right for a second. Yeah. <laughs> That is pretty uh, fantastic. Um, it's a twelve by six. This is my question. This is my question. <laughs> so you know. This is my question. Do you think it's good? Uh, um, I, I. Do you look at that painting and do you think it's good? I look at this painting no, and no, I no, think no, no, that no. I think that it is as good as I could have done no, that. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, but that's but that's actually to go into like what you were saying before. Like, do I know when I have a good right, one? Exactly. There was like one event in Annapolis a couple summers ago, uh, early um, June. Usually, paint yeah. Annapolis is, and I had a vision going into that show. Like, I'd painted there like twice before. I knew exactly what I wanted to paint. I knew it was going to take a lot of work, and I had plans. And I never planned like that. But I knew what I wanted to do. And at the end of the week, I looked at all my stuff and I said to myself, I could not have done. I didn't think they were my best paintings, but I knew I couldn't have done better than what I did for that time. Like, and I knew that I maybe had a contender or something, but definitely, you know, I don't think that that's every once in a while you get something where you say, Oh, this, this is a, con- I always say contender, right? Sure. You know, but you also don't know until you go into the room and see what everybody else paints. But then at the same time, judges have different. Yeah. No, no, no. There's no, that's a whole we can't thing, even get into you know? like, the, we can, I mean, we can talk yeah. about any of it, but you know, you can't really game theory, any of that, you know, again, you, you can go with what your gut says and that doesn't, it just is interesting to know. I guess I'd, if you, if all the paintings that you saw this year, you know, and your, and the things that you did, um, hmm. You have a top 10. If you had a top 10, if you had to rank them at the end of the year, best paintings that I saw this year on the plein air Eastern circuit, would one of yours make it? Never. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But you want to get that award. You need that award. No, No. but I, you know, I, what, what really, I think like for, for, you know, the award I won this past year at, at plein air Easton for my nocturne, best nocturne, um, you know, I think what we don't discuss at these about these events is, you know, if this is how I make a living, you know, yeah, you go to work, but you know, you are creating stuff and you also have stuff going on at home. Like I had a lot of stuff going on back home, um, during this year at plein air Easton. And, you know, you kind of go out there, you're like, I have to do the work. I have to hand these paintings in, but you got all this other stuff going on right in the back of your head. And, that also clouds your vision of, let's say, going into an event saying, I want to paint this. And now you got all this stuff going on. And now that's, is that going to take away from the vision or the feeling that you're trying to do or whatever? And, you know, that, that nocturne was definitely like nighttime at Easton this past year really gave me peace as to like other things I was dealing with, um, at home per se. Um, and when I had won that that award, you know, like, and the judge gave the talk and everything, you know, I'm kind of used to the whole, oh, it's small. Oh, it's, you know, the judges like to talk about that. Oh, it's small, but I noticed it or whatever. But he got it this year. He understood, like, what, like, he said something, like, the, what he said in his judge's talk. I was like, he really understood, like, what. I didn't even understand at the time that when I was painting it, that's awesome. like there was something that came out when I did that painting that even when I brought it into frame, I was like, you know, the night before I said to, um, you know, one of my friends, I said, which one do I put in? Like, I, cause I was clouded from, mm. you know, all this stuff I had going on and, you know, he's like that one and that one. I'm like, you sure you don't like that one and that one, whatever we go through this dance, all of us go through this dance. Right. But um, I think when I saw it on the wall and then when he, like I, it, 
it it meant something to the painting did i i saw what it meant to me when it was on the wall and it was just kind of like oh yeah you know it totally you know came from my soul but when to hear somebody else say something like it it that they got that is really cool like that was a well, really and it was, cool it was moment that, for that me. Guy. i mean we've had we've certainly everybody we've been talking to this since this year has been you know so uh appreciative of the judging not that they haven't in any yeah, other hard years to, hard to top dan weiss he's yeah, pretty ex- exactly yeah. smart guy that's the best way to say it and and um i i think i remember chris i don't know it was i was you were you everybody goes in the back and sort of listens to the judges thing and um he was like in the middle of yours i think and somebody people always talk to each other because you're in the back and they think you can talk you know and, and <laughs> and the guy was like <laughs> wanted to say something to Krista or whatever and, and she was I was watching it. I was like, is she going to talk to him or is she going to listen to what Dan Weiss says about her painting? <laughs> I was laughing. At the, at the time. And she had to very politely be like, he's talking about my painting right now. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that? Yeah, it was really funny. <laughs> so I guess one of the last questions that I like to ask people, and again, I think it's partly like where my headspace is, is, and you're kind of, you kind of spoke to it. It was a great lead in in talking about how this year, you felt very clouded. You had some heavy personal stuff that was influencing your your clarity and your vision. And I think it is really hard to feel creative or to be creative when you might be in a really dark space or if you find yourself really stuck. So do you have any advice about what you do when you find yourself in that kind of situation in order to persevere? Um, because, you know, we we can't really just, like, give up, you know, especially if you're in a high-pressure pressure situation like right. Easton. You can't just say, God, this – I mean, you can say it's too hard. I mean, I guess maybe that's a mental – like, we should be talking <laughs> about it, whether you should be saying it's too hard. But, um, you know, I think that, you know, what do you do when it's feeling so clouded? Like, how, how, what are some of the advice you could give to people about that? Uh, you know, I – it's so hard because, you know, the first year I ever did Easton, my father, we had, we had lost my father like a month before. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I, the first time I ever applied to Easton, I had, I got in and now here I am. I've never done an event at this, of this caliber. And, um, you know, that, and I had gotten sick mm-hmm. from the heat. So <laughs> you have to drink water when you're there. And I, <laughs> now I know, um, but Everybody you just kind of, you know, there's, there's, you know, don't be afraid to talk to people, you know, and, and say, listen, I'm really having a hard time. I mean, I didn't know any of you guys and I really didn't know many of the artists there either, but, you know, some of them are, who are, you know, some artists kind of can, you know, see if you're having a hard time and give you some advice and whatever. But I mean, this year was a lot different. I tell you this year, I had a harder time than that year my dad had passed. And, um, you know, I think it just, it comes with, again, years of doing these things and, um, you know, maturity as an artist. But I, you know what, I did my, I did like the Meet the Artist event and I did a couple other things. And then there was one day I'm like, I need to go hide where no one could find me. I need to do a painting. And I just cried and I got it all out. and on we went, you know, and, and, you know, I'm lucky to have good friends and, and people to talk to. And I'm not one to sit there and whine about what's going on, but, you know, people could, I feel like there's, I feel like it's a close knit community of what we do. And, and somebody's always there to kind of, you know, push you through a little bit, you know, but you just got to do what you got to do sometimes. Yeah, Lena. Well, that was a great um, answer. It was a yep. great answer. Yeah, yeah. Was a great answer. Uh, um, well, I'm happy to um, count Krista as one of my friends. Yeah, yeah, Krista. And I have... <laughs> I'm happy to have you guys as friends. Even though they didn't go to school together, they probably would have been yeah. friends. Yeah, we, so. we 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 did we did talk about during the break that I um, am class of '96, not in the same school, but like we could have gone to school together, which is kind of like, oh wow, what would that have been like? And um, Tim and I decided that Krista and I probably would have been friends, and I think that that is yeah. true. Um, so <laughs> Tim, would you have I been friends with Krista? Is a much larger question. What, what do you? <laughs> I'm already yes, obvious. I mean, um, whatever. He was a jock. I don't think he would have given us the no, time of day. No, I didn't. Hang, I, didn't <laughs> hang out with, I didn't hang. I didn't hang out with. I didn't. I purposely didn't hang out with. I didn't hang out with anybody in particular. 
And I'd never wore like fashionable clothes back then. Cause, Wait, back then? Because right, right, I wore a uniform, so there was nothing fashionable. Well, yeah, in, about high, what we were in wearing. high school, you had a uniform, girls' uniform. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I wore a uniform my entire life going to school until I wore for college. Eight, I wore for, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I remember. But is a painting clothes a uniform? It's kind of still a uniform. <laughs> Right. I remember the first my, I, the first my first day of high school. I went back to the uh, to, to sit in my classroom, waiting for them to call my bus for me to go home. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. Uh, Krista, Krista, we <laughs> hope to see you in July, if not beforehand. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. We wish you luck with your move. Um, she is sitting amongst um, all kinds oh, of yeah. boxes and um, art yeah. supplies as she is <laughs> packing up her studio for uh, and her home for a big move up up a flight of stairs. Yeah. So um, we wish you very good luck at that as well. I have one rapid fire question for you, Krista. Um, mm-hmm. Cake or cupcakes? Oh, cupcakes. All right. There we go, everyone. <laughs> Yay, thank you, Krista. Oh, thanks, Krista. Thank you so much for having me. It was me. good Love to talk guys. to you. See yeah. you. Bye. The Plein Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation and was produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions with additional episode music by Scott Gratton. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plein Air Easton at pleinairesteon.com.